Hello, good evening. Um, I think uh, we're going to start now. It's just gone 12 past six uh, on the 19th of February uh, 2022. Good evening and welcome to our 13th webinar in the series CamDoc UK Talking with the Community. Happy New Year. It's, it's been ages since our last webinar. So we're absolutely delighted to restart the series. My name is Dr. Linda Bello. I am the chairperson of CAMDOG UK, and I'm also a GP. Our topic today is very close to my heart and something that I deal with regularly as part of my job. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to invite one of the founding members of CAMDOG UK, Dr. Oswig Nath see to do a brief introduction. I can just tell you a little bit about him before he speaks. He is a senior consultant obstetrician with subspecialty training in maternal and fetal medicine. He currently works at Al Wakra Hospital, Hamad Medical Corporation, Doha in Qatar. He's also an assistant professor of clinical obstetrics and gynecology at Will Cornell Medicine in Qatar. Welcome, Osric. Uh, lovely to see you again. Hi, Linda. Thank you very much. So um, I, I'm, I think I'm particularly delighted that we've uh, been able to uh, run this webinar. It's, it's been in the works for a while. Um, but um, recently, over Christmas, I had the um, opportunity at, at, at a birthday party to, to sit next to um, someone that I know, um, a friend's wife, um, who was recounting her experiences over the past few years. Um, and to be honest, it, it was a complete nightmare. She'd gone from a highly functional um, woman um, with a high-flying job to being virtually unable to cope with work, um, to having extremely distressing symptoms. Um, so this, to my mind, um, projected the importance of having a webinar where we can have a a chat with, with, with members of our community and sort of answer the questions and, and demystify what, what the menopause is. The menopause essentially is, is part of aging for women. Um, and so every woman will, will, will go through the menopause. Um, I suppose the main facts are an understanding of the symptoms of the menopause, um, which can be very variable. For some, it can be quite mild, for others, it can be quite debilitating as, as, as I was being told um, by my friend um, just recently. So I'm delighted that we have on, on, on this uh, webinar a couple of, of, of great speakers, um, one from general practice and, and also a colleague from, from, from secondary and tertiary care who will, will sort of break down um, the various issues around the menopause um, so that women, our sisters, our wives, our mothers are prepared for, for this eventuality, really. So without much ado, um, I'm really grateful that um, I'm sure there's people on here from um, all sort of parts of our working careers, people from the Middle East, people from uh, the UK, people from Cameroon, people from the US, so people that we all have contact with. Um, so welcome. And I hope um, over the next 90 minutes or so, you will feel that your time has been well spent. Please, please put your questions in. Um, we'll endeavor to answer them in the chat or in the Q&A. And if we don't, then we'll answer them, some of them live as well. So thank you all for coming, for joining us this evening and hope you have a, an educative uh, and fulfilling session with us. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nafti, for that very, uh, pertinent introduction, which has really set the scene for this important webinar. I must say that when I was um, having a look at menopause again, um, I was struck by a statement uh, from Nuffield Research, which said that one person in four, uh, one person in four with menopause symptoms is, is actually concerned about their ability to cope with life. Um, furthermore, we know that approximately 10% of women uh, seriously consider giving up work uh, due to the symptoms. And it's not only the women themselves, but uh, you know, elsewhere, Dr. Nathalie, as you mentioned, partners of, 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 of women going through the menopause do struggle to understand what's happening to them. 
as they try to cope with this uh, fast moving and often overwhelming symptoms. Um, there's also misinformation about HRT, hormone replacement therapies, which are one of the most effective th treatments in relieving many of these menopausal symptoms. Um, and, and unfortunately that can lead to women not coming to see, uh, seek advice from people like us, GPs or, uh, so I'm really hoping and I'm confident that by the end of this webinar, your questions and concerns would have been addressed by our esteemed panel. And, uh, and as Dr. Nafti said, please, already you can start putting some questions uh, in the question and answer box and we'll do our best to, to answer them. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce our first speaker. He's also one of our CAMDOC UK members. His name is Dr. Serge Ngemba. He is an academic family physician, uh, also he's also, is a GP. He's based in the east of England. And in addition to working in a semi-rural GP surgery in Norfolk, he is a primary care researcher at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. He leads the primary care specialty group for the National Institute of Health Research in the east of England, and he's passionate about research implementation in general practice. As for example, Dr. Ngemba is actually the principal investigator for the Panoramic Trial, which is a nationwide study looking at finding new treatments for the coronavirus infection. He's generally interested in women's health as a general practitioner, which, which makes him the perfect candidate to, talk to, to, to give us a talk today. So over to you, Dr. Serge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chairperson. Uh, so the, thank you for the opportunity to share. It's nice. It's always a, a, a good uh, vibe and um, uh, it's always a joy to be able to share uh, with the community around the subjects of, uh, of interest. And the menopause is definitely one of those. I'm not sure if I'm able to share my slides or if the slides will be shared by, by the team. But I will try and share. Is that all right? Okay. How am I doing? Perfect. Excellent. You're doing very well. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Right. So um, yes, thank you very much. And um, I, I will start straight away because the menopause, uh, or, or, although it, it seems quite straightforward for for a lot of us, uh, as um, uh, our chairperson said there, Dr. Bello uh, and Dr. Navti, it, it is quite a complex subject uh, and there's so much to talk about uh, within the menopause that uh, it's really hard to condense everything in, in one single talk, but I'm hoping that uh, after tonight that a lot of us will have, um, uh, you know, key messages uh, and at least that will be able to, uh, you know, look at the menopause in a different light. Um, so I'm hoping tonight to talk about generally what it is um, and why is the menopause a priority uh, in a health system today. I'll be talking about the UK particularly. I know some of us are not here, but a lot of the things that we talk about will be applying generally. Uh, I'll also touch on the symptoms and uh, potential health risks. Um, you know, we've already touched a little bit on them generally uh, with the introduction uh, by, by Dr. Bello there. Um, but they'll try and dive a little bit deeper into the health risk and why they are there. Um, and in terms of treatment, basically just talk about uh, non-hormonal treatments. Uh, and my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Malik, would uh, develop a little bit more what sort of treatment options are out there. So let's start by defining what the menopause is. So the, the menopause, if you look at it etymologically, um, you know, menos uh, stands for months uh, and pause stands for stop. So etymologically, we're looking at the time in a woman's life when the period stop. Uh, but it is a little bit more complex than that. It's not just that specific, uh, you know, stop in time. It is the whole period just before and even after the stop. So all the months and years before that and all the changes that uh, the, the stop involve. Uh, and as, as Dr. Nafti said, it's a natural aging process uh, and it does occur because of these hormonal changes, uh, particularly the fact that the reproductive system, the ovaries are producing less 
uh, of, of the uh, hormones that they normally would produce, and particularly uh, the, the estrogens. And, and the uh, symptoms, as you will see later, are related to all the benefits that estrogen would normally bring to, uh, uh, to the woman's health. So looking at why it is important today, uh, I, I thought I'll bring up this, this slide just to highlight the, the fact that the menopause is a little bit more prevalent in our society today. So this slide here shows life expectancy, uh, you know, from the about, you know, 1800s there to, to today. Uh, and as you could see, if you take, for example, around 1900s uh, or a bit after, uh, life expectancy actually uh, was about 59 years, which means that uh, for, for a woman getting around, you know, getting to the menopause in her 50s, uh, most women would leave about eight or nine years uh, in, you know, as menopausal women, which means that uh, perhaps the symptoms uh, would not be lived for, for, for very long. Uh, you know, fast track to today, 2022, where people leave to 80 and even more. Uh, so a lot of women will be leaving uh, their lives a, a good 30, 40 years with uh, menopausal symptoms if they are menopausal in their 50s. So a lot more prevalence there. But it's quite a lot more impact than that uh, because obviously we, we're a little bit of a sandwich generation where you know a, a lot of women uh, will be working uh, you know would contribute to to uh, um, to the economy uh, and unfortunately if symptoms are severe uh, they can have an impact on their lives both at work and at home uh, so so it's it's quite an important topic to be aware of uh, and obviously to, to 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 keep an eye on so why does it happen? I did say a little bit earlier, so changes in your hormonal make. Uh, and so you'd see that um, as you approach the menopause, so women will start to experience certain symptoms because of that reduction uh, in the oestrogen. Um, uh, in the UK, the average age for uh, the menopause is 51, but we'd usually think about diagnosing the menopause for anyone with symptoms between 45 and, and 55. But, but the age is really just a mark because the symptoms can occur much earlier. Uh, and I think my colleague will be talking about early menopause there. Uh, for, for those who experience and develop the menopause much earlier um, because of various reasons. This is particularly for the natural menopause. The menopause can also be in, induced, which means that it would happen artificially uh, because someone has had a surgical operation, uh, had their um, ovaries removed, uh, or you know, because of certain treatments like chemotherapy, you know, radiotherapy, or some hormonal treatments. So the menopause can happen for, for these various reasons. We'll be focusing mostly around the natural menopause here, which occurs uh, you know, so naturally. Now, how do you identify it? I, I did leave this slide blank on purpose because you know, for a lot of diseases or pathologies or problems that we encounter in primary care, we, we tend to have a list of symptoms that will make us think about a problem. Uh, but in the menopause, it doesn't fit that bill quite well because the symptoms can be so varied and the intensity can go from, you know, as uh, Austria was saying, almost nothing to quite debilitating symptoms. So I thought I'll, I'll leave this blank and then maybe populate it with the symptoms so, so we, can, we can see the, uh, the, um, you know, the variety of them. Uh, so if I start with the first one, so irregular menstrual cycles is one of the very common ones and actually, you know, fits into the definition. Uh, and it, it's a little bit stranger because, again, some women will experience lighter periods, more regular periods, whilst others will have a, a slightly a longer cycle, more heavier periods. So the change in a menstrual cycle is quite a common one. Night sweats, you probably uh, would know the menopause from hot flushes and night sweats uh, as the most popular and the most well-known symptoms, uh, but they can be quite debilitating as well. Reduced sex drive is also quite an important one. Uh, so the libido goes down with the menopause and it can be one way that you recognize it. Uh, hot flushes there that I have mentioned earlier. So, so they're qu quite common symptoms, but I like to stop on hot flushes just to say that although 75, 80% of women uh, who are experiencing menopause will have hot flushes, that still leaves a good 20% of women there who will not have hot flushes. 
So I'm saying this just to say that we, we shouldn't focus only on hot flushes when we're thinking about the menopause. You could have your, you could experience your whole menopause without having hot flushes at all. It's still 20, 20%, which is, which is quite a number. Um, so there are symptoms like mood swings, you know, your mood going up and down without clear reasons. Uh, poor memory and concentration. We were touching on, you know, the workplace earlier. How do you uh, focus on your work? How do you concentrate on your work when you've got this brain fog constantly? Uh, and sometimes that's the only symptoms that you will have. So it's important to really keep their, your mind open. Vaginal dryness is a very important one because it's very late reported uh, symptoms. Uh, I was reading a statistic saying that, uh, you know, a third of women would report uh, the uh, symptoms after three years of enduring them, uh, while sometimes the treatment is quite easy uh, and, and quite straightforward. So, so vaginal dryness is important symptoms to bear in mind. Uh, if I go back up here, anxiety, panic attacks, frustration um, is very common. In fact, one of my mentors, uh, you know, talking to me about the menopause was saying she's never seen any uh, a woman, you know, coming to her with menopausal symptoms who hasn't experienced anxiety. And that could be for a variety of reasons, including the fact that, you know, you, you don't always understand, we don't always understand why the symptoms are there. In terms of your mood, you've got your low mood, uh, fatigue is a big one. Um, uh, the uh, anecdotes that I get uh, is that the fatigue is similar to what you would have if you if you're in your first trimester of pregnancy so it's a quite a prominent fatigue for some people uh, sleeping difficulty uh, and again here it, it it tends to be a pattern of sleep where you can get to sleep but it's so hard to stay asleep and you'd wake up either because of other symptoms or or, or because uh, of the the fact that you just can't stay asleep uh, by, by itself so I did mention excessive sweating there during the night, uh, you know, uh, painful intercourse, which can have obviously wide uh, uh, ranging consequences on relationship uh, and, and so on. Uh, weight gain uh, due to uneven fat distribution. And this will be usually because as your body is producing less uh, estrogens, you realize that your body is trying to maintain that estrogen and by creating more fatty tissue, we, you, so you realize some changing in your body shape because of, of that phenomenon. And because obviously fatty tissue do produce some amount of, of uh, um, uh, uh, estrogen derivative or, or the light, and also your body will try and, and compensate for the lack of estrogen there. So uh, frequent urine infections, uh, say vaginal infections as well, and muscle and joint pains is another important one, just to say the variety of symptoms, but also the fact that it's so very easy to think about different conditions. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of the patients that I've seen uh, have been referred to rheumatologists, you know, being diagnosed with all sorts of other conditions, you know, depression, uh, fibromyalgia, um, whilst, you know, we're looking at the menopause here and, and it just because, you know, initially we haven't had that presence to just ask, when was your last period? You know, when, 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 when did you first see your periods? And so muscle and joint pains can be quite severe for some people to the point that we're thinking arthritis and other conditions, but uh, it is possible that it is just the menopause. So, so if you look at the slides, it's very, a great variety of symptoms in so many different systems that it is really hard to pin things down. And that's why I think in primary care, we have the advantage of the uh, continuity of care, the fact that you can see your doctor again and again uh, if, if the, the diagnosis and treatments uh, are not um, uh, are, are not satisfactory and you can get to the diagnosis so look probably a bit better than you would do in secondary care when you're seen but as a one-off. So there are factors that influence these symptoms. Uh, as we said earlier, you know, you, the, the, the range of symptoms can be from very mild to actually quite severe. Uh, and research shows that there are 
factors that can determine how early you get your menopause uh, and how severe you get these symptoms. Uh, it, it's not 100%, but you can influence these symptoms uh, or, or, or the onset uh, with, with some factors that are changeable. Obviously, there are factors that are not changeable, like genetics, the family history. So, you know, if you know when mom had her menopause, likely daughters will usually have menopause around the same age. Um, but there are things like, uh, you know, if you have your periods early, uh, it's been shown that you can have, uh, you know, your, your menopause a little bit early as well. Uh, but also, you know, if you've had more children or use contraception, it is shown that you can have your menopause a little bit later. But things that you can have an influence on, like smoking or managing your weight, uh, you know, the type of nutrition you have, alcohol intake, caffeine, all these things are shown to, when they are in your life, early on in life, um, influence how quickly you get to the menopause and how severe your symptoms might be. Uh, as an example, it is shown that people who smoke, for example, would, would attain the menopause up to two years earlier than, than non-smokers. So, so, so lifestyle, diet are really quite important in kind of preventing a severity of certain symptoms. So I've come here again just to show again the fact that being menopausal or going through the menopause will affect every single part of your body. And this here just shows, you know, from the, 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 the headaches and, and the brain to right down to the bones and, and you know, to, to, to your feet, you, you get a wide range uh, of symptoms there due to the fact that estrogen are affecting every single part of your body. And I just wanted to highlight some body changes here, which we've discussed a little bit earlier. Uh, things like insomnia, difficulty sleeping, uh, the, the, the problems with fat distribution, mood changes, um, you know, vasomotor symptoms here, you know, meaning the uh, um, uh, you know, hot flushes and, and, and sweatiness and the urogenital symptoms. I just put them out there because they do have an impact on your overall health uh, a little bit more that, than the others, and particularly fat distribution, which will put you at a higher risk of cardiovascular conditions uh, and also things like diabetes. So in addition to uh, these body changes, there are health risks to, to the menopause, and these have been well proven, particularly women who have the menopause early, so the early onset menopause or artificial menopause, if you've had your uh, ovaries removed for medical reasons, and you're therefore living in a menopause longer than you would have if you didn't go through that uh, procedure. Uh, so it's been shown that uh, it, it, you know, menopause can have significant health risks and I want to highlight here the risk that would come, for example, to the bones. And we know a lot of us about the menopause and osteoporosis and the impact that it has on it. The fact that the menopause means that your bones with time uh, are, are thinner than they should be. Uh, reading some articles about the impact on the brain and actually showing that uh, you know, women who've had a longer menopause are actually at higher risk of developing conditions like dementia and Parkinson's disease. Um, so it's quite, quite significant findings. And cardiovascular diseases, which we've mentioned a bit, a bit earlier, but just to illustrate, uh, before the menopause, it is well proven that women would develop less cardiovascular conditions than men. Uh, and you would see less heart attacks, for example. Uh, but after the menopause, all of that changes. Uh, and actually, women get you know, so, so, uh, are likely to get fourfold uh, higher risk of, of, of cardiovascular diseases after the menopause, which is something that is quite staggering indeed. And, and just highlights the fact that it is important to be aware of the menopause, but not just to ignore it and to address it. Now, we did mention about the economic impact there because with severe symptoms, obviously, a lot of women can't even work. Uh, thinking about early retirement and, you know, you know women at both 50 hours, a significant proportion of, of the workforce in many countries and in the UK. So quite important that these things are addressed. Now, I just, uh, you know, kept this slide here just to show, again, how common the symptoms are. Uh, the fact that they last for, for quite a long time, but also the fact that you know, half of the women do not see their doctor. 
And because a lot of people would say, you know, this is just the symptoms, same as my mother has had and, or my aunties. It's just part of aging. And they, you know, we just put, put up with it. But as we've seen earlier, there are some health risks to consider um, and there are treatments available. So it'd really be a shame to go through debilitating symptoms such as they can be uh, if, if treatments are there. So I'd really encourage anyone with symptoms and all concerns to contact their GP. So when do you do that? When do you contact your GP? Um, I like this quote from the British Menopause Society, which says that uh, all women should have the opportunity to have accurate and non-biased information about the menopause. And I do emphasize on the non-biased part here, because as you're going to see when my colleague will talk about uh, hormonal treatments, there are also risks to taking hormones, to taking hormonal treatments, but you can see the menopause itself uh, has uh, health risks. It's usually a, a case of balancing uh, pros and cons from both and balancing the risk on both sides. Uh, but it is important to have that information. And there is no better way to do that than to try and document yourself. Uh, because as I said earlier, there's a lot of misdiagnosis, a lot of the symptoms that the menopause will bring, like the anxiety and the low mood will be misdiagnosed for something else. Um, An and interesting audit we did in my surgery, for example, was to look at uh, every woman between 45 and 55 who's on antidepressant uh, and to just look at whether we've actually asked any questions about the menopause and whether it, it, it could be a misdiagnosis. So the best way really to, to uh, make sure that things are on the table uh, I tend to advise it is to have some form of scoring system. And you can find these on the NHS website. Uh, there are many apps now that are available to the public where you can just go and have a look at all the symptoms that are listed there, see which one applies to you, uh, see how severe the symptoms are. And when you go to your doctor, you already have that list there. And in fact, uh, you will find in, in many surgeries, some doctors are quite interested in the menopause already, which means you could even ask the receptionist, who is the doctor who deals with the menopause here? Uh, and, and so talk to that doctor, go in with, with your symptom list already and say, oh, I think this might be the menopause. What do you think? Or, you know, it, it could, could this be hormonal? Could this be related to hormones? And that makes things a little bit easier. But any concerns really, given the health, potential health risk, it's really important to, to approach your, your doctor, to talk to your GP. And again, obviously, if you're unsure, you know, looking at the NHS website and the apps, it is quite useful. Now, in terms of treatment options, I, I will not cover the, 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 the whole treatment options. My colleague will be doing uh, more uh, sort of medication uh, later. Just wanted to emphasize your lifestyle and diet, because as you've seen earlier, your lifestyle, your diet, have an impact on how early you might have the, you know, you might experience the menopause, but also um, how severe your symptoms might be. Uh, something I didn't say earlier, for example, is, is that um, it's well known that Japanese women experience less hot flushes than other women. It could be a cultural thing, but it is demonstrated that it could also be uh, related to the high levels of phytoestrogens in their diet. So just the fact that they have this particular diet rich in things like soya uh, or tofu earlier in life, uh, you know, means that a, a, a lesser proportion of, of women uh, in, in that country will have, uh, you know, uh, hot flushes, just as an example. So big, uh, big uh, uh, impact here of your lifestyle and your diet. But again, even in the menopause, a lot of things that you can do in terms of lifestyle and diet would have an impact on how severe your symptoms are and will help you manage your symptoms uh, before or without medication. And if there's a big one to, to look at is really uh, smoking, which, uh, as we said earlier, has quite a huge impact, but would in, impact on things like, uh, you know, hot flushes, uh, you know, sweatiness uh, and so on. Uh, weight management is really important even after the menopause because they will help to control symptoms. Uh, consumptions of things like alcohol, coffee, uh, spicy food. You know, I, I say spicy food, looking at my sisters from, uh, from West Africa where we like spices. But it, it, it tends to show that spicy food can have an impact on menopausal symptoms as well, something to be aware of. Um, so saturated fat intake, so we did say about your weight, 
uh, regular weight bearing exercise is really important part of maintaining bone health um, and maintaining general health. You know, a calcium intake, looking at how much calcium you, you consume, uh, and just really general measures to, to, to think about. You know, lose clothing when hot flushes are an issue. Uh, you know, there are cooling scarves now, a lot of new technology that, that uh, we, we, we may tend to use. Uh, but it's important to just uh, you know, keep in mind that what you put in your lifestyle in terms of managing your weight, diet, uh, you know, consumption of alcohol can have a big impact before the menopause, during uh, and in, in the management of the menopause. So to finish, I just want to highlight that it is a significant life event it affects every woman and whether you have symptoms or not like, like you've seen you know not having estrogen for a long period of time will have a health impact will have health risks which have to be managed um and you know seek uh, information uh, for to look at your individual risks really important uh, there are you know very helpful websites in the uk we use the nhs website is really helpful and has quite a, a nice uh, a, a approach to giving information about the menopause in a very simple way, simple terms. Uh, lifestyle and diet, I cannot say enough about this, it's really important. Uh, and, you know, to, to finish, talk to your doctor if there are any concerns. Thank you very much. I, I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. Bello. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ngemba. Um, if you can uh, stop sharing your screen, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Uh, for that very uh, wonderful presentation. A uh, few things I, I just wanted to highlight, you know, half of women are not coming to see us, you know, that, that's very, very sad um, um, where, where we can help, you know, when we can really help them. So um, I wonder when you did do that um, uh, survey uh, audit in your surgery about those that had come with depression and didn't know uh, and you wanted to find out whether it was menopause, do you mind sharing the results and, and also any ideas of how we can, you know, obviously, apart from webinars like this, where we tell people, please come and see us, no symptom is too little, do you want to just, just put it out there to our, to, our, to our attendees that, you know, we really, we're open, it doesn't matter, it's the pandemic, no symptom is too little to come and talk to us about, because as you said, you know, the symptoms can be quite uh, uh, debilitating. Yes, indeed. Thank you for that. I'll start with your last statement just to say that um, I don't know if after the uh, talk we'll be able to share some resources because there's quite a lot out there uh, which are actually quite quite helpful to, to map symptoms uh, and to help uh, the woman herself manage those symptoms, which is which is uh, something that will be helpful to share with those who are here tonight. Uh, our audit was, I suppose, perhaps a little bit biased because one of my... Uh, a colleague is, used to be a gynecologist and, and is now a GP, so she's got quite a keen interest in the menopause. So we only had about 11.8% uh, who hadn't had, because the idea of the the, uh, the audit was to look at anyone who's on percent looking at whether they've been asked about their last period and whether we had information about when they had their last period. It was only just about, uh, you know, you know the, uh, just around that percentage. It's quite, quite low, I would expect, if you think about the fact that half of the women don't come to us. So I would expect it would be much higher uh, if we didn't have that keen interest in the surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Um... Yes, and, and the other thing is as well, you know, patients coming with um, different symptoms, you know, fatigue, symptoms, low mood, symptoms that, you know, we could really uh, be attributing to, to, to other cases. And I guess, um, as you said, really sharing some of those symptoms, you know, some of the apps. So I don't know whether Dr. Ngemba, you'd be uh, able to just write some of those websites in the chat box. And um, just for us to, be, uh, Dr. Nafti has really started writing some on there, but some of the symptom checkers, because you're absolutely right. You know, I think a lot of a lot of our patients in the UK, they come in to see us. They only have 10 minutes with us. We may not pick it up. And I, and I know that sometimes, you know, patients come and say, oh, my GP didn't think about it. And it's true because sometimes you've come in with so many other symptoms and we think it's something else. So it's really useful if you've used one of these symptom checkers and you've come in and you say, I definitely, I think it must be the menopause and that kind of, that kind of put, puts our mind straight. Um, so we've had a few questions for you um, in, in, in first in the, 
question and answer uh, box where uh, Dr. Samina has um, answered a, a few of them already for you, but I think it would be helpful if you can just say uh, from Dr. Nkoko, he said, uh, very articulate from you, quick question, what is the difference between a hot flush and a, not, and a, and a night sweat? And I think Dr. Sam, Dr. Malik has answered that it's an intense heat felt on the upper body, neck and face, which is a hot flush, uh, which is followed by excessive sweating. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, whether it's all the same hot flushes and night, night sweats. That was one of the questions that was asked. <laughs> no, it's definitely quite different. Uh, and it's always a little bit uh, just uh, you know, hearing a man talk about the menopause because you can only describe what you've read, isn't it? Yes. Uh, but yes, it is definitely different. Uh, and the, the hot flush, I think there's quite a clear description of it in the literature. Um, and the description is usually, um, you know, it's, it's like a sensation. Um, so it's a sensation of heat. Um, and it, it, they say it's a flush that lasts about three to four minutes, uh, frequency ranging from, you know, once a month to, you know, once every hour. Um, and apparently it's an intense heat that you would experience in the back of your head climbing up or from the lower back climbing up uh, and that you can experience as quite an intense hot sensation. Um, so the, the night sweats will be, you know, obviously you would have perspiration as part of it. The hot sweat doesn't always have that. The hot flush doesn't always have that. Although hot flush can be associated with other symptoms and some women will describe palpitations, uh, lightheadedness, dizziness, uh, fatigue would come with it. Uh, so, so it can be quite varied in intensity and in the type, but the difference would definitely be the perspiration in this case. Okay. Um, there's a question from Christine in the chat box, uh, which uh, Christine, uh, please put in the question and answer box next time. It's just easier for us to find it. But Christine is saying that one of the symptoms she has apart uh, from the general symptoms is pain under her armpit and breast tissue. She doesn't smoke and only socially at uni in her first year, which was in 1984. How do you treat these symptoms? Um, she's gone to her GP about all sorts of symptoms, which uh, she has found debilitating. Um, Dr. Samina as well, if you wanted to chip in, that would be great. Uh, start with you, uh, Serge, Dr. Serge. Yes, this is definitely one that I haven't covered sufficiently, perhaps in the uh, in the presentation, because there's so many different symptoms. But breast tenderness is a very common symptom indeed, um, and there are a variety of advice regarding breast symptoms, from simple things like uh, wearing more supportive bra, uh, you know, and um, uh, to to more advanced treatment like hormonal treatments that Dr. Malik will be covering later on. Um, the, the we used to uh, suggest even in primary for for breast tenderness, which I understand is now uh, not so much uh, um, accepted within the guidelines down here. But um, there are a variety of uh, you know herbal um, uh, medication, uh, you know vitamins that that kind of helps. So vitamin E, for example, e has been cited as helping some people. The problem with the menopause, uh, and as you would see for many symptoms, is that what works for one person might not work for another. Um, so, you know, there isn't a hard and fast rule for these symptoms, unfortunately. So it's a case of working with your GP and a trial and error, uh, and then until you find something that, that works for you, that, that's what I would say. But I think Dr. Malik would probably got a bit more experience in these symptoms than I do. Lovely. Dr. Malik, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, no, I think he's, he's right. Um, not all the symptoms are the same. I said to my patients, we all do, don't look the same. How can you imagine your body responds to conservative treatment or medical treatment would be the same? So you would expect a change, but cannot be quantified at the same scale for everyone. So uh, yeah, but there are herbal stuff. Um, 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 we can suggest magnesium, which is quite good as well for hairs. And, but overall, if there is an isolated pain in the armpit area, it better be investigated before we would have said that it's only down to the menopause. Excellent, thank you. Um, very interesting comment in the chat from Pauline Lemon, who said that she's currently reading a good book in line with Dr. Serge's lifestyle change approach 
called The Menopause Reset by Dr. Mindy Pels. I haven't read that myself. Uh, so that, that's a good one. Um, question in, in, in the chat from uh, Abby, um, asking whether symptoms are different for ladies who have had a dis hysterectomy. And I think Dr. Samina, you answered that one by saying that it depended, it depended at what age the hysterectomy um, was done. Um, a question in here, uh, Dr. Serge. Um, I actually, uh, for Marie Claire, um, sorry to hear this, Marie Claire, you have a pituitary tumor, which is what delayed the onset of your period. Um, you're currently on carbogolin and you're not sure if this is going to delay the menopause. Um, no. Dr. Samina. Um, I don't think so. That would be any different than for her because if, the, if there's a high prolactin, which were inhibiting uh, her um, uh, estrogen regulation in the body from the brain centers, um, then I would probably say that her uh, she will have what her other family uh, member women have the menopause. So it's highly unlikely that she would develop an early or a late. It's not a genetic re reason. So it is more likely um, the uh, secondary to the prolactin. But having taken a prolactin uh, treatment does not delay her menopause. You probably would achieve around the same time, yeah. Perfect, thank you. And just one last question before we go to uh, Dr. Samina for her presentation. Um, uh, Dr. Nafti, did you want to answer this one? It says, uh, thank you, Dr. Serge. One yeah, question. I think Serge, Serge yes. is ideally placed to answer that question. Yes. Um, after the audit, where you, found, where you found cases of anxiety, could you define if anxiety symptoms were the core, were the cause of or consequence of the menopause? I guess basically they're saying, yeah, with all the ones that had anxiety, was it because they had menopause that they were anxious or, or vice versa? <laughs> No, I, th I don't think we could say that from the audit, unfortunately. Uh, the idea for us really was to see that we have asked the question to everybody with anxiety or or, or uh, mood uh, symptoms or anybody who's who was treated for depression uh, or for anxiety that they had had a conversation about the menopause. It was really just to make sure that no one is on medication for depression and they haven't discussed the menopause at all. Um, so, so we couldn't really say whether the symptoms were related or not, uh, but on the percentage of the women that were identified, what we did was just to go back to them and ask the question, you know, how are you getting on with, uh, you know, with your periods and are there other symptoms? So just really proactively going to the woman and asking whether there are any symptoms that they are concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, but for, for the rest, obviously there was uh, either... Um, the fact that it was directly asked or that it was volunteered uh, or uh, incidentally recorded, we had the last menstrual period. We, we didn't have to really dig into it. So it's not possible to say whether it was menopausal or not. Uh, and th this gives me the opportunity to just say again that the fact that the menopause would cause a symptom would not mean either that, that you can't have both, if that makes sense. Um, so a bit like Dr. Malik was saying earlier, if you've got pain in the armpit or breast pain, uh, obviously we do worry about breast pain as a symptom. We usually want to investigate it and make sure that we're not looking at something else. Uh, you know, we worry about breast cancer, for example, is something that we, we would want to, to investigate um, and, and not just put things to the menopause. And the fact that I have anxiety with the menopause doesn't mean I can't just have depression like everybody else, isn't it? So, exactly. so yeah, so these things can cohabit. Uh, but what's the message here is just to say it's important to consider the menopause because it could be either the cause or contributor. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Serge. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to you with some questions. Um, no so that leaves me to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Samina Malik, who is really an expert in the field and it's really our pleasure and our privilege uh, to have her here with us today. She's a consultant gynecologist in the University Hospitals of L uh, Leicester NHS Trust. Um, her other roles are being lead for menopause services. Um, and she's also a recognized trainer from all the colleges, so Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health, uh, British, British Menopause Society. Um, she's the undergraduate lead for reproductive health for the reproductive health block of, of the University of Hospitals of Leicester uh, students 
and she's also an honorary senior lecturer for the University of Leicester. So as I said before, it's an absolute pleasure and privilege uh, to have her here today. Um, over to you, Dr. Samina. Thank you for your uh, nice introduction, Dr. Bello. Um, as you rightly say, I'm a bit passionate more about menopause. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you, Dr. Yeah. Samina. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, Dr. Ngamba have actually uh, mentioned basic uh, things that everybody would have to look into their lifestyle. Uh, when it comes to general health, but particularly around the menopause, because the women tend to have double the risk of developing high blood pressure after the menopause. And uh, alongside the cardiovascular risk that we mentioned, because the blood flow changes. Blood, um, so we have to be very careful um, to uh, what we do in our life. So there are a lot of things which NHS recommends for us to uh, do but as a as a human being we also we should be doing that um, as a routine um, uh, what you, I must say that lifestyle uh, for all of us um, I don't have the control so there'd be a bit pauses when we go through these slides because somehow I couldn't upload from my side um, so can we go to the next slide please okay so um, most importantly as we have touched base should we treat menopause how long should we treat menopause so there are two important questions in here. Uh, Short-term uh, symptoms, um, which could range from a couple of years up until 20 years. So like hot flushes we mentioned before, sweats we mentioned before, increasing aches and pains in our body, new onset of anxiety, which was not there and it starts around the perimenopause phase, reduce interest in the sex or discomfort with the sex. So these are the uh, we are short-term goals, but there are long-term goals for the uh, menopause management and that particularly uh, the younger population who develop menopause um, earlier than 45 and particularly are the earlier than 40 years of age and that is called premature ovarian insufficiency uh, terminology. It doesn't not only affect the quality of life, fertility choices, um, and then the long-term implication uh, with regard to any heart attacks um, or um, there are thinning of the bones, which is called the osteoporosis. Bear in mind that it affects adversely on their spine at the lumbar region and also at the, uh, at, at the both hips. And if there are fall, there are high risk of fractures with that. And 20% of these fractures can have increased mortality. So overall, you can see that the um, addressing the long-term consequences in the younger population, if they develop menopause or older population who already have those risk factors, which can make them at risk of osteoporosis, then the HRT is, has a long-term uh, benefits. It's not only controlling those hot flushes and night sweats, which a lot of people think they will get better in a couple of years, or according to my patients, when they say that, most of the GPs start the majority around 60 to say, oh, that is the enough time. But again, that is, that is not the case. Can we go next? So I always like to um, talk about this thing, which is called um, happy. Now, we, we did mention about the 80% of the population have um, hot flushes and 20% not. I think they do have it, but they're happy. Why they are happy? There might be somebody who had a fibroids and they have heavy periods, painful periods, endometriosis, or some religious reasons. A lot of women, when they come to that age from different ethnic backgrounds, they prefer not to have a period because they want to get involved more with their religious practices. So as a result, I have found that five to 10% of the population actually would find the menopause as a blessing in disguise for them and would try to tolerate the menopause symptoms just because that's what they were looking forward to it. Um, there might be a person who doesn't want to have a surgery. So they would not like to go ahead for any endometriosis surgery, or they would not like to go ahead for a major fibroid surgery. And they've been flooding and having menorrhagias. And they must be, they sometimes are on those injections, 
which can reduce the blood flow or they could be on injections to create the artificial menopause. So for them, it's kind of a blessing in disguise, but we, we are not promoting that. It's just one prospect of it. Other way around, as Dr. Sach has already addressed on that, natural way, regular exercises. It is mentioned in the NICE guideline and it in the NHS, two and a half hour of exercise a week, 30 minutes um, in a day, even not every day to do some aerobic exercises. It's running, it's swimming. It could be yoga as well, which have actually have a good impact on the anxiety and anything associated with anxiety, which, which is palpitations, fast heart rate, or then flushes with that. Mediterranean style life, and Mediterranean style diet. So I'm not saying the diet which is promoted. So the diet which is rich in the fresh fruits and the veggies, um, olive oil, and they all have been shown that they actually improve the symptoms of the menopause. Um, so that is also been all, uh, be, can be recommended um, to our patients when they are coming first time to the primary care or when they are um, trying themselves. So when, they are, when you're home, you try to do these things yourself and you can take with some of those symptoms of the hot flushes. Next one is the um, um, HRT and we say it regulated bioidentical HRT and I will uh, um, have some slides on that. There are some medical drugs which we use as alternatives for the menopause symptoms. And then you can see it's a bit red in here for me because these are the people who are um, uh, asking doctors and uh, bringing the informations with them. And these are the things which are not regulated anywhere. And these are the uh, bioidentical HRT, but the word is compounded bioidentical HRTs and some herbal medications. So of course, we're gonna talk about uh, what kind of herbal medications they can still take. Okay, next. Um, we, and we can go to the next, please. Okay, so why would say that we should be looking into taking the regulated HRTs? These are called regulated bioidentical HRT. These are the hormones which are though manufactured in the lab, they are 100% what your body or a woman body was, uh, was producing before the menopause. And as a result, the right terminology for them is, so if somebody comes to you and say, I need a bioidentical HRT, then please go with what we should be giving them. And that is estradiol and progesterone. So these are the bioidentical HRTs. And as we know, the benefits are remarkable within a 10 years of menopause, whatever the age is, or under the 60 years of age, particularly it's called window of opportunity for the heart conditions, that it prevents the complications, it prevents the heart attacks and angina in the people. So we should not miss that window of opportunity. And hence, if a woman is asking or if a woman is enlightened to ask for a HRT, and if there are no contraindications, then this is the prime time to start that. And their most effective treatment for the hot flushes and low mood, 75 to 80% respond to. And of course, a dose adjustment needed depending upon different people. It improves the sexual desire different form of HRTs, which are, whether you take as a, we said, systemic, which is the through the skin or as swallowing it or using in the vagina, which is called vaginal estrogens. It reduces the vaginal dryness and pain associated with the intercourse, which actually with a negative feedback to our brain reduces the sexual desires um, in a woman's brain. So it's a vicious circle of discomfort in the vagina, which lead to our brain centers to say, I don't want it anymore. I did mention about the role of the HRT for prevention of the bone thinning, prevention of the osteoporosis, and any falls or any fractures associated with that. When the HRTs are given, particularly in the vaginal area, it improves the urinary symptoms. It reduces the risk of urinary tract infections, which is infection of the bladder. The recurrent bladder, uh, in not only the infection, but also the overactivity in the bladder. Like some women are be saying, oh, I'm going too much in the day or wake up in the night to go. This is called overactive bladder. And having a vaginal estrogens actually not improve the vaginal dryness, 
but it changes the it changes the lining in the bladder and it prevents the onset of infection in the bladder but also it desensitizes your bladder and 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 hence those events of going too much to the toilet so your bladder which been like pulsating in there it become a bit more calmed and in a controlled way so it has a dual advantages having a estrogen through the vaginal route next so of course we all want that hrt is good we all want that the hrt uh, have the positive impacts on our body and we can do a lot about it but we all know those things but there are little things which put you off which can put off your patients or if you are a, a menopause person then you would see that it can start mild headaches okay usually subsides within a month of taking the hrt it's not migraine okay it's just the hormonal changes in your body some fluid changes in your body which makes you to give some mild headaches you can take simple paracetamol and stuff or reduce the do initial dose of your hrt and then build it up from that likewise some breast discomfort 10 to 20% develop again it settles down with passage of time you might need some paracetamol but don't ignore the red flag symptoms if they are there please speak to your doctor so that it could your breast could be examined so we should not always assume that this breast discomfort is secondary to hrt because it might be something else going on which is common in this age so we need to be wary of the fact and then ask for the help some women can have more bloatedness again we say the hormones is if um, the women sometimes come to say, come to you and say oh before my period i have a lot of discomfort and i feel my breast size increases because of the different hormones in our hrt um naturally in our body similar the one in the hrt especially the progesterone component may give you a bit of bloatedness or may give your patient some bloatedness um irregular bleeding can develop and irregular bleeding now we have to vary of the fact that when and how these irregular bleeding are investigated if somebody having a heavy bleeding um or recurrent bleeding um on hrt then it would better be it to be investigated usually you can observe for two or three months and then you can start um uh, doing a referral to the secondary care if it cannot be addre addressed on the primary care so by the 6 months if the bleeding has not settled down it should better be investigated with an ultrasound scan or a hysteroscopy which is a camera test go inside of the womb and you take a biopsy from the lining of the womb just to make sure that you don't miss any abnormality as again around 50 years of age 10% of the women might have undergone underlying conditions which sometimes exhibit with taking hrt and as a result this is the time to pick it up though the cut off is about 6 months but by the time you do referral and they go to the secondary care i would say after 3 to 4 months if things not settled down by altering the hrt by changing the whole second hormone called progesterone or improving the dose of that but don't ignore so any of those symptoms which have been a side effects of the uh, starting a hrt if they are severe if they're not settling down to always think of any other condition underlying that and please investigate that in due course of time so this is from a british menopause society and i just love this um uh, uh, information over there So this is the data about 1000 women um age 50 to 59 and this is the um breast cancer in that population so whatever the risk factors are 23 cases of breast cancer are diagnosed um uh, for every 1000 women age 50 to 59 in the UK and if we have a BMI just above 30 can you imagine the risk is doubled if we are drinking two or more units of alcohol a day we have five extra cases with smoking three extra cases so if somebody come to me and, and talk about oh hrt and the risk which is four extra cases in here can you see i would say to develop the breast cancer if you have these two or only this you don't need hrt you can't blame hrt because this is the fact because these are the bad estrogens which develop in our fat cells and these estrogens 
not only increases the risk of breast cancer, but the cancer of the lining of the womb. So as a result, these three factors um, have to be addressed in a very earlier on in our lives, but exactly when we're coming to the perimenopausal age, when we have to give them HRT, I'm not opposing the HRT, but I'm just saying that time and money need investing into these as well. Barely two and a half hour of a moderate exercise. Can you see how much the risk is reduced? Seven less cases, seven less cases are there. So please, please encourage your patients. And if you are a patient or you are a woman, please look in these statistics. If you come to me with the BMI 40 and 50, I, I won't hesitate to give you HRT if it's debilitating symptom. But I will explain to you this first, that your risk of breast cancer is five times higher than taking the barely any HRT. So lifestyle modifications needed in here. Next one. And of course, when we talk about the breast cancer on HRT, then these are the statistics which we have to look at it. So the, these are the terminologies in here. So I will just simply explain. This is called combined HRT. A woman who had a uterus, she needs two est uh, hormone, estrogen and progesterone. When they take the combination of estrogen and progesterone every day, so they don't get a bleeding, it is called continuous combined HRT. But of those people who are younger than 50 or who has not achieved menopause completely, they are giving bleeding HRT or cyclical HRT, and the terminology is sequential combined HRT. So overall, for every 50 women, there are three cases of breast cancer. But if we take the HRT in every day, which means both hormones in every day, there's one extra case for every 50 cases. And that is if we take more than one year, but less than five years. So HRT is dependent on dose and duration. So if somebody is taking up till five years of age, these statistics are helpful for them to understand. But if somebody is taking for a longer time, time then every five years, the risk increases more and more. The risk is lesser on the sequential form of HRT. But if somebody who already had a hysterectomy for any other reason, then if you can see in here, the HRT is, has a 0.5% risk, which is extremely low. So even in the NICE guideline of 2015, it is written that risk is low or negligible or even reduced with the estrogen HRT. But this is the new update from August 2019. And that's why we use these figures. And we say, yes, estrogen can, can increase the risk, but I am pretty sure because these studies were not randomized studies. So I'm pretty sure there were other confounding factors. There might be the women who are drinking heavily in that part of studies. There might be women who are smoking. There might be women in here who had a high BMI. So as a result, that one extra case for every 200 case might not even that significant at all as it is shown on these slides or in according to these studies. So what we say in that, HRT does not increase the risk of ischemic heart disease. Even the people of the women who had a heart cardiac event in the form of angina and they are stable, they can take the HRT. It, if it is given a HRT first time around after the 60 years of age, still it doesn't harm the heart, but it has no extra benefit because the window of opportunity usually goes within a 10 years of the menopause. Overall, the risk of stroke is less under 60 years of age in the absence of the risk factors. So by taking the HRT, stroke risk is not increased. But if you give first time HRT in the older woman after 60 years of age, particularly in the tablet form of the estrogen, then it can increase the risk of stroke in them. And likewise, the same applies to having a blood clot in the leg or in the lung or in the brain, which increases with the tablet form of estrogens because the progesterone comes in the tablet form as well. But I'm talking about the estrogens, which goes through our gut system into our liver and produce different chemicals, which makes that at more a risk of stroke or more at risk of the clot, but in the older population or the population who have the risk factors. And in them, it might increase that risk. Same cautious take is if you have a gallbladder disease or any liver condition 
or a woman taking medications for their epilepsy, then you probably try not to have the tablet form of the estrogens because again, the metabolize in the liver and it can change the availability of those home other um, medications in their body. 40% fibroids shrink after the menopause within a few years. So if somebody continuously taking HRT after the menopause, that shrinking might not take place. And if the fibroids are sitting under the lining of the womb, then they might tend to have heavy bleeding, just like as the women do in their 30s and 40s, if they have multiple large fibroids or they particularly have fibroids sitting under the lining of the womb, which tend to make them bleed a bit more. If somebody only keep taking estrogens and do not take the second hormone progesterone or give a longer gaps to take that, then estrogen keeps stimulating the lining of the womb. And as a result, it can result in an imbalance of the hormone in the lining, which can result in overgrowth. And the terminology is called hypoplasia. If it's been continuously taking with no uh, uh, intention to uh, change it, then the small risk of endometrial cancers on that as well. The risk of ovarian cancer or HRT, there are not many studies that it increase. So overall, if any increase, it's marginal. And again, it is our risk factor which make us more at risk of ovarian cancers than taking HRT. HRT is not actually associated with a high risk of ovarian cancers. So for general understanding, if somebody already had a hysterectomy, or they have a marina coil for contraception or for heavy period, they only need estrogens. And those estrogens come in different preparations. So they can come in the form of a gel, which you can rub on your skin. It can in the, comes in the form of a patch, which you can apply on your skin, or a spray that you can uh, just do on your skin. So they are called transdermal estrogens. So they are very good, they are safe, they do not risk in, increase the risk of blood clot formation at all. So as a result, women with the BMI above 30 ideally should not be given oral estrogen and they can only be, be dealt with that. But if the woman cannot tolerate or uh, there are other factors, they have a skin conditions, then the tablet form of estrogen can be given to them. But if somebody do not have hysterectomy or they do not have a marina in there, then of course they need a combination. And as I mentioned, if they are not completely gone through the menopause, or at least one year after the menopause, uh, above 50 years of age, and less than two, uh, or up till two years, less than 50 years of age, then should be a bleeding HRT. Long after the menopause, then of course, non-bleeding HRTs are recommended, because they prevent the overgrowing on the lining of the womb, and the cancers related to that. Vaginal estrogen come in a lot of different preparations. They come in the form of creams. They can come in the form of pessaries uh, or ring, and they have a different dosages on them. So again, not every pessary is the same strength. Not every cream is the same strength. Only the ring come in the same strength. And if the vaginal estrogen doesn't work, then a new product has come into the market, and that is called Intrarosa. It is a product called DHEA, so that actually changes it to bit estrogen in the vagina, a bit of testosterone in the vagina, and it is a second line treatment if vaginal estrogen doesn't work. And if that doesn't work, then we have a lot more of the things we're gonna address in this in the next couple of slides. That is the most important thing. You'll probably be looking forward to it. Should we take, should we say herbal medications? Look, herbal medications are not regulated by medic, uh, MHRA, which is the medic, uh, medicine regulatory authority here in the UK and every country like FDA in the, in the US. So as a result, what problem is that there are not large studies on them. So like for medicines, there are like thousand and thousand enrolls into the studies. They are called control groups. They are like active groups, but for them, nothing like that. And most of them actually, they are sold as supplements because they don't need licensing. So as a result, their safety is in, uh, in doubt. If somebody is really keen to try herbal medication, then yeah, you can have your yams, you can have tofus, and you can, so you can see that these are the things which do have relatively high estrogen contents in them. You can have like um, uh, red clover, which can have it. But if you really want to have the extracts of that, then what you should do is 
you buy it from those herbal shops which are part of some kind of traditional herbal registration um, uh, licensing with them so again not the mhra but but their own traditional herbal registration number for them but bear in mind if you if somebody is taking medication for their breast cancers or for their epilepsy for their asthma for heart condition they can interact with them even their slow dosages they can interact with them because majority of them you swallow so they go through the liver so as a result you need to be cautious when you are using them according to the national evidence um, st john's wort black cohosh and isoflavones can be given but sadly we can't prescribe them on the nhs it's a very costly way to buy them from the uh, from the herbal shops and use them instead we should go for regulated bioidentical hrts which are actually the hrts um, but yes um, st john warts uh, actually according to the nice guideline can be given to the breast cancer patients as well so but bear in mind if they're taking tamoxifen and those uh, medication then we need to be careful what we can suggest for them and for me this is a no so if somebody comes to you and asks that oh it's bioidentical and bioidentical or body identical i would say it is no right okay. it is a red area there is no regulation for them even no traditional herbal registration for them there is no safety data overall everything is a problem and most of them actually some have been manufactured in similar factories which are manufacturing the the normal hrts that we generally give to the people it is not regulated or licensed in the uk only been given in the private sector by some some of some people which i, I can't name even asa ruled in 2017 against the misleading promotion of this compounded bioidentical hrt so we have to be careful if you are a clinician like myself and somebody comes to you please direct them to the because the progesterone come called micronized progesterone in a tablet called utrogestin it is from soya plant so it is exactly what herbal people would be looking forward to but it is exactly the same progesterone which a woman body is making so as a result this is your bi uh, bioidentical hrt not any of these things which are misguiding misleading they are just supplements you better had a food which is rich in them instead of wasting money on them then you have some other stuff that you could have thinking and my favorite is the psychological treatment which is cognitive behavior therapy because it 75% effective similar to hrt in reducing the anxiety and some of the hot flushes and night sweats are actually addressed as the women are sleeping well again it's a costly way you have not many people or counselors who are doing it but there are so many website women health concern website has a six page document on it if you are a good reader please download that and read it it really helps you some of the um, some of the places like leicestershire county council they have white health website on them in which you can do your self referral for these sessions so there is a help available you just need to be a bit more proactive to ask for that help and you might not need anything if you get, if you get some cognitive behavior therapy uh, and 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 exercise and your diet so please look forward to those things and um, if you if if somebody is experiencing vaginal discomfort um, and they are say breast cancer patient on those medications which they cannot take it, any kind of estrogen like letrozole and estrozole they are called aromatase inhibitors then of course there are range of lubricants available and but most importantly moisturizer vaginal moisturizers um with the name of replens and silk um natural oil pure coconut oil available anywhere in the world pure olive oil available in the world they are actually improve the vagina discomfort vulval dryness and rubbing of the clothes into the vulva so it all really help there is limited evidence of acupressure or acupuncture again there is no studies on them so as a result we cannot promote them and then we comes to the uh, these medical treatments so these are the drugs used for different thing like clonidine for blood pressure and gabapentin uh, for uh, pain 
and then different anti-anxiety medication like venlafaxine and paroxetine, they can easily be given because the hot flushes is actually a regulation of heat center in the brain. And there are different hormones which are, uh, sorry, uh, there are different chemicals in the brain which are produced excessively when there's a lack of estrogen. It's called norepinephrine. So as a result, the clonidine, gabapentine actually work on the brain center and about 50 to 60 percent cases, it reduces those hot flushes and night sweat symptoms. Um, Clonidine is the only licensed product which can be used for, so any primary care physician actually can give it to your patient. But nice guideline have said, these are alternative and only be given to the people if like they have a breast cancer or active thrombosis, so they can't have HRT. It should not be first line treatment. First line should still be your regulated HRTs, which are identical to the woman's body. Some places only in the private, not resources in the NHS for excessive vaginal dryness symptom, there are vaginal laser treatments, which rejuvenate the vagina, but there are controversial studies on their effectiveness and the burns and things associated with that. Tibolone is one of the medication that we uh, usually endometriosis doctor give. Basically, it's not HRT to take it, but in your body it does convert to small estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. So it has a low potential of HRT it can be given to the women, but generally less than 60 years or up to less, less than 60 years of age. And the, the most important thing, testosterone therapy, I think a lot of people uh, would be thinking why it is needed. Loss of libido is quite remarkable around the menopause, but importantly, the loss of libido symptoms are um, uh, addressed with the uh, testosterone. There is only one licensed product available in Western Australia. Uh, some of the center like our center in Leicester, I had this approval of Tostron 2% gel. So there are different names in here, Tostron, Testim. Idea is that five milligram a day of testosterone is needed for a woman. So it's a 2% gel. So it is alternate day application, but the rest is um, uh, it's a sachet like Testogel, very tiny amount you can give. Uh, probably in the next couple of years, we might have endrofem in here once the licensing is approved in here. And uh, that will be a, a deal breaker for, because testosterone not only improves the libido, but energy level and concentration. And then contraception. Again, don't forget, perimenopause start a bit earlier on. Bear in mind, average age of menopause in the UK is 51 year. 80% of menopause by 55, so it is recommended for any menstruating woman or anybody who is taking contraception, like they have a mini pill or marina and don't get a period, they need to carry up till 55 years of age. But if somebody stopped their period before 50 years of age, then at least next two years, they should carry on with the contraception. And if they stop period after 50 years of age, then at least for a year, they need to carry on with their contraception. Um, so it is important that don't forget about the contraception uh, when uh, you are dealing with the menopause. And if you have taken the contraception, then next question, what happens to my HRT? So if somebody have developed a early um, ovarian failure, they can have a combined pill if there are no risk factor, or they can have a, any form of estrogen through the skin or tablet route, or they can have a marina coil down there or they can have any HRT, but they use either copocoil for contraception or as a barrier method for contraception. And for the perimenopausal women, again, the options are, you can have a marina coil and estrogens, or you can have a HRT with a barrier method or a copper coil. Uh, so you, it better be that do not have excessive two or three kind of hormones, just stick to the, what is easy to monitor and you know what is going to happen next with them. Thank you very much. I hope I, I'm not running too late with this. That's wonderful, Dr. Malik. Uh, really, really, really useful talk. Lots of questions for you. Um, okay. Tell me if you can stop sharing the screen for us. That would be great. Thank you. Um, I'll go straight to the to the to the questions. Um, uh, An anonymous attendees just saying that uh, they've had they have a minor. In situ since 2014, um, they're age 52. Ideally, she'd like to have the marina and the gel, but there's a long wait for the coil replacement. Uh, it looks like she needs to have that done in hospital. 
um, what, what would be a good option for now while she's waiting? I think then she can have a utrogestin because it's still doing the contraceptive job for her. So mm -hmm. you better have transdermal gel along with a utrogestin tablet. If she's not having a period at all uh, for a few years, then better she can have utrogestin every day, not 25 days because they would have withdrawal bleed. But if she's having regular bleeding, then better to take in a sequential manner. Okay, perfect. Um, that's done. Um, uh, a question for William, probably asking on behalf of his partner. Once placed an HRT, is the woman supposed to take it for the rest of her life or what can we stop it after some time? If the later is possible, latter is possible, what approach is taken to quit to remove the woman off HRT? I would say that age is not a limiting factor at all. It's the risk factors. If the patients accepting the risk factor of prolonged use of HRT, only risk factors technically is a breast cancer risk. So if there is a lifestyle modifications which reduces their background risk, that actually ages not. So what you generally do, if your women are taking four or five years, because on average between five to 20 years is the hot flushes time. So after five years, if you weren't keen, just reduce the dose first. Don't, don't ask them to stop. Because restarting HRT increases the risk of thrombosis and stroke. So be better to reduce the dose. And if they can't cope, carry on. Because there would be a woman who are osteoporotic. There would be a woman who is given the cardiovascular protection. But most important is quality of life. I agree. Perfect. I hope that's answered you, uh, answered it. And Mary had the same question about how long uh, someone should take uh, HRT, which is, as you said, it's all, I guess it's all dependent, isn't it, on, on the woman and what symptoms she's, she's having. Um, there's a few questions in the chat that I'm going to uh, dig out. Um, I actually had to take a picture of them. Um, another one was about how, how many years, how many years does menopause last that came from Lily in the chat? It depends upon what the definition of that menopause is. Is the menopause, we mean hot flushes, night stress, and uh, changes in the mood, then it cannot be predicted. It's different for different people. It's different for different ethnicity. Like Caucasian people, they have more severe menopause compared to Far Eastern people. It is a lifestyle, BMI, everything matters in there. Also the Asian and the, uh, our African and Caribbean girls, they have a different kind of uh, a tolerance mechanism. So bear in mind. So I would say that minimally you looked at between two to five years when the hot flushes are at the peak. And then um, later on, it would be depending upon your patient choices and their, their tolerance uh, uh, of day-to-day -day activity. Can they do it without HRT? That we have to stick them on. Excellent. Um, and actually that brings me back to a question I saw in the chat about whether there was any kind of ethnic differences in um, in sort of men menopause, I mean, uh, specifically, I guess, black and black and Asian. So, are you saying that is it? Do we is it is it less in us or? or... No, I think we do we do, we do get, but we report less. Um, I'm in Leicester. Fifty percent population is ethnic, so we outnumber the our the actual uh, Caucasian population. My mm. clinic attendance is ninety percent are not a non Asian population or may I say not from the BAME background, yes. and the 10% what comes are who are born uh, and raised in this country who knows how to go and ask for help. I barely see any woman who's like from overseas and living in this country, have ever walked through the door to say, I'm struggling with the menopause. They will have a marriages breakdown. They will have anxiety going on, but they will never come up and say that, oh, this is because of menopause. So I think part is because of lack of information on behalf of our women to say this is the symptom and it can be actually addressed. Thank you for really highlighting that and uh, and actually that's why we're doing this webinar today you know obviously most of the most of the the attendees the participants on here are going to be people that look like me and you um, and so we want to say that you know come and see us come and see our GPs come and see me and Serge and all my our other wonderful colleagues and we can refer you to lovely doctors like Dr. Samina, who can help you when we can't help you. And, and actually that gets me to my next question. I wanted to ask you, Dr. Samina, what kind of patients uh, are we, uh, my colleagues and I sort of referring to you? What, what, you know, what are the sort of things that we, we're no, normally referring to you just so that you know, our attendees know what they can get us to refer to you for? Because I guess sometimes it's difficult to get a referral. Yeah. I think it depends upon what kind of service you run. 
we have two kinds of service in here. We have advice and guidance, and even the complex patient, I can do advice and guidance if you have enough information coming through that. But I must say like a breast cancer patient, if you're not confident how to deal with them, especially how you titrate the different alternatives, because breast cancer patient, we, though it's contraindicated, but it could be ER, PR negative, which might need actually benefit from HRT. And bear in mind, those are generally the genetic ones, which HRT is not gonna modify them anything. So I would say that if somebody have a multiple risk factors um, or they have thrombosis, or if they have um, SLD. So these are the things which may be as a primary care physician, or you have tried one or two types and, and you think, no, I'm not gonna reach with something. So look at your area, wherever the primary care physicians are, you might have referral on the NHS is going to a year now. So I would say the advice and guidance, maybe within a two weeks, you get the answer. Just try to put as much in, in information as in your request so that uh, person on the other hand, feel comfortable to address that answer, you know. Perfect. So uh, just for our, our non-medical colleagues, what Dr. Samina is meaning is when, when we as GPs refer to her, we can refer so that she can see you in the clinic, but because of COVID it's taking months or even up to a year, but there's another facility where we can just write what we call advice and guidance. So we write a, a letter, a, a, like a message to her, uh, one, of her, one of her colleagues will read it and they can normally respond to us within a couple of weeks, so long as we've put all the required information um, in, in the notes. So that's obviously one thing that, you know, um, that we can do for you. And I think that, you know, knowledge is power. So, you know, if, you, if you've gone in and seen one of us and we're having a bad day and we've not really listened to you and you really want us to have uh, referred you on, just say, oh, I heard that you could ask for advice. Can you not do that? So, because it's really good to, 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 know, to know that these things are, are possible, especially if we've tried um, uh, several um, sort of hormone treatments and, and that hasn't worked for you. Um, there, there are some few questions here from Christine about, she was saying about the fact that she's been smoking and she has smoky breath and some numbness. Uh, Christine, um, I think most of us on here, although two of us are GPs, I would say, please, a lot of those symptoms are probably not related to menopause. And could you please just uh, book an appointment um, uh, with your family physician so that you know we can they can take a good history and uh, uh, because numbness you know not 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 usually a symptom of the menopause and it'd be nice for you to have a, a full kind of checkup so if, if you can do that Christine um, wherever you are um, Kuni is asking if there's any chance that COVID could be more severe on a woman in the menopause uh, and how about other diseases like hypertension. Uh, COVID and hypertension, I can't address on that, but COVID and menopause, I can say that mm -hmm. when the in first wave, uh, wave of the COVID came up, there were studies coming up. The women who are on HRT, actually, they tend to catch less COVID or if they catch, they have less severe symptoms and hospitalization, which again put the thing into the prospect that estrogens are so protective about their lungs and about their hearts that actually they do not. Uh, but okay, we are waiting for more studies because uh, one study came up from America, change in the menopause, uh, change in the menstrual cycles after the COVID vaccinations as well. So uh, there are a lot of new stuff coming up. I think we need to give a couple of years before we get the final answers. But I must say that estrogen was protective against the severity of the COVID. It can't prevent, but it can be protective against the severity of the COVID. Yeah. And as we're talking about research, and we know that this is Dr. Ngeba's uh, forte, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else. I mean, technically, this is not a, a webinar on COVID, but uh, you could just answer <laughs> the question about the hypertension. <laughs> yes, indeed. I think, yes, uh, about both. Uh, theoretically, uh, COVID is, is more severe when there is um, uh, an impediment to the immune system. And as we've seen with estrogen affecting every single aspect of the woman's health. Uh, obviously, I'm not surprised to hear what Dr. Malik is saying there, that uh, you'd have uh, the potential to have less symptoms. Uh, in fact, the study that you mentioned earlier, we're looking at recruiting everybody above 50 
uh, women and men because they are all potentially at risk of severe symptoms and there are new antiviral tablets that we're trialing to see if they uh, prevent severe symptoms and uh, if they prevent admission. Um, so, so that that leads to to the, you know uh, hypertension. Um, you know, the, one of the reasons why one would develop hypertension might be some modification in, in uh, your blood vessels, indeed, uh, in terms of rigidity. So, it's, it's a possibility that um, uh, not having that protective factor from your uh, estrogens would mean that you're more at risk. So, so I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, and in fact, talking about uh, someone mentioned numbness there, um, uh, I, I know it's not a typical symptom, but but the, there are people who describe uh, feelings around the, you know, crawling feelings around their body, perhaps also related to the fact that you've got dry skin with the menopause, uh, that is very common. And that is also related to the effects that you expect the oestrogen to have on your skin. So, so oestrogen can impact on nerve function and skin function so you know numbness is not impossible but again like you said it's best to see a doctor indeed and have a full history and full examination uh, but it's not something that you can rule out indeed hope that helps yeah. wonderful thank you sir um another, another question on the chat box there um william is wondering he said he didn't really get how this continuous hrt is administered i guess he means sequential um, is it one month on HRT, the next month off, and the cycle repeats? Uh, Sergio, Dr. Samina, uh, any of you? <laughs> uh, estrogen is every day. So whatever the form you take, whether it's a tablet or whether it's a, a gel or a spray or a patch, so whatever the formulation would be, like a patch is uh, twice a week uh, changing, which means as long as the patch stick, it releases estrogen but after two days, it will wear off, so you have to change. Um, likewise, the gel is to apply every day, the spray is to apply every day, tablet is to take. So estrogen is every day. The second thing is the progesterone. So if we are on a bleeding HRT, then we take like 12 to 14 days every month progesterone tablet, and it brings on a period, usually when you are towards the end of, or you finish the tablet. But when you are on non-bleeding HRT, you take those tablets every, every day. There are patches, which are pre-made patches, which have both hormones on them, and they're called Conti patches. So some people actually would benefit from them as well. Perfect, thank you. Uh, before I ask some more questions, um, there is a survey in the chat. It would be quite, we'll be quite grateful if uh, those participants still in here could uh, complete it. It's only gonna take a, a minute and it's gonna help us to uh, know what we've done well, what we could have done better, uh, so it's just the link is just there on the chat. We've just shared it again. Thank you very much in advance. A um, few more questions on there. Um, I think this question has been answered before, but the anonymous attendee who had the Myrina in, uh, and I think it's expired and there's a long wait and wanted to know what else could be done. She's saying that she's still bleeding, so she's sequential. Can, she, can you please repeat what I should ask for, please? Um, so if you're still bleeding, then of course you need to have estrogen, as I said, every day. And you need to have a tablet called Eutrogestin, 200 milligram for at least 12 to 14 days each month. And it's, if you don't have any particular pattern of your bleeding, then you take date, um, like first 12 or 14 days of the calendar month from first of the month till the 14th of the month. And that's why you will have a more regular withdrawal bleed. Uh, and you will predict that around mid of the month you would have a bleeding. But you have to have estrogen every day. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Samina. Um, uh, Dr. Serge, um, can someone who is on high blood pressure medication and statin take HRT? I think this is a repeat question, but I guess we can answer it live again. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear oh, sorry. you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm struggling a bit with my mask today. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a question about HRT and hypertension. Is that right? The statin, yeah, and being on a statin. 
Yes, I think uh, you know Dr. Malik has covered the, all the uh, risks there, isn't it? Uh, so it, it's really about cho choosing the right formulation uh, and about balancing risks uh, and benefits. Um, and, and like she said, um, you know, if if there are uh, any contraindications to taking hormonal treatments, you do have non-hormonal options there that can be prescribed right from primary care up to uh, you know when you see her. Um, but I, I don't think that statins by themselves would be a contraindication, and, and I don't see why uh, you know your blood pressure medication would be. Um, but indeed, you do need to look at the the whole person, their history, personal history, and family history, uh, and consider all, all the risks and benefits. So it, it is worth having that conversation, a holistic conversation with your doctor, to make the right choices. Lovely. Um, so one more question. I, can, I know that we are kind of uh, running late. We were due to finish at 7.30, but we did start 10 minutes late. Uh, there is a question here, um, which I think Dr. Malik, you can answer again about diet. I think you, both you and Dr. Serge spoke about this. Could diet be a contributory factor to early or late menopause? I think you've mentioned this, but you can just answer that again. I think um, uh, early or late menopause. Early menopause is uh, can say if somebody is athlete or doing anorexia, those kinds of people who just manipulate their own uh, information from the brain down, so they can develop. Otherwise, most of the early menopause is kind of genetic, is kind of antibodies in our circulation which prevents against the ovaries. But the only population which is severe anxiety with an anorexia and with the um, athletes which keep the BMI of like around 16, they can develop and those are reversible ones. Mm. But if it happens naturally because of the antibodies against our ovaries or because of the chemo radiotherapy is given, they are, they are usually an irreversible one. Late menopause has, we, it could be a genetic as well. So if, if your if sisters or aunts and have a late menopause, different races have little late menopause, but Bear in mind, if it anything goes beyond 55 years of age and it's not a regular bleeding, then you think of endometrial cancer and hyperplasia. Again, all those risk factors that we mentioned before, they are there. But nearly 50% of our female population, they have a BMI of above 30 now. So that can easily contribute. So late menopause is sometimes is a uh, red herring that anything going with the lining of the womb and it should not be until it's been investigated by an, a biopsy of the lining of the womb. And if it's fine, you can expect, I have a person 61, she's still having a period. And we every now and then check and make sure that it's not. So that is one exception. So one case does not generalize the whole of it. So late menopause always think something not wrong there. Thank you. Um, we've got, uh, Mary has written a few things on there. Um, Dr. Nafti, did you want to answer yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think she makes a, a really, really important point um, about the role of men in, in, in women's health. Um, and, and I suppose if, if women themselves have a lack of understanding of what the, the issues are with the menopause, um, if, if the men understood what their wives or their sisters or daughters were going through, then they would clearly be able to direct them and guide them. So. I think that's part of what we're trying to do here. It, it's in terms of sensitization, it's in terms of providing information that can help in that regard. So this webinar, of course, will be available recorded. So um, please encourage your husbands and, and, and the men in your life to watch this. Um, so that sort of educates them. Um, and, and that's a critical point um, because as Samina highlighted, our populations are not seeking the help that's out there. Um, so they're clearly at a disadvantage, not just with the immediate consequences, but also the life long term consequences of, of the menopause. So it's critical that we start to redress that thing. I mean, this is not just for the menopause, it's across a lot of health conditions. Um, so we're putting ourselves at a major disadvantage and we need to redress that. And this is this is a point of what we're trying to do today. So thanks for that question and that point. Yes, Mary. So um, as uh, Dr. Nafti is saying, um, this, this presentation is going to be is recorded. It's going to be on YouTube. So if you go to our uh, YouTube page, which is camdoguk.org, and um, um, uh, one of uh, that's also in the chat. So you can literally just click on the link 
subscribe to it as well because that way anytime we have a new webinar you're going to get alerted to that and you know yes watch it watch it with your loved ones and um, if any of you have listened now and feel um, that you, you you might be having symptoms that are related to the to the menopause or you just have symptoms and you think oh I want to discuss this with my GP please come and see us you know um, no, no problem is too little you know we don't you know there's this misconception that you come and see us and you know we don't want you to come and see us we, we really do uh, and for such an important topic so um, I think we could probably be here all night you know it's such an important topic and um, uh, before I, I thank I close the webinar what I'd like to do is just ask um, our educational lead uh, Dr Valentine Gua to just come and tell us a bit about the next webinar that we're going to be having. Um, he's the one that is always coming up with the topics that we need to talk about. And, you know, he really was passionate about us talking about this today. And, and I'm really grateful that he did. Over to you, Dr. Ngwa. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I thank, thank you so much. Actually, um, I think I've got uh, Dr. Nafti to thank for this because he was the one who insisted that we really need to uh, have a talk about the menopause, and I can see it from our attendees, it was highly attended, which means it was quite a popular discussion. I can't thank the panelists enough, and of course, Dr. Dr. Bello for moderating, it's been quite fantastic. We have always come up with these webinars to try and meet with the demands of our community um, to see what kind of health things we want us to talk about. Uh, and going and um, so far we've got we, I think we've been able to address quite a few things, particularly because when we started, it was at the height of the COVID pandemic, and um, we know the our community was uh, suffering disproportionately uh, more. Uh, and I think we've done a bit of justice to uh, many of the topics as per your feedbacks. Going forward, we're trying to uh, build up. Uh, next uh, webinars for the year. And uh, we looked at the various themes we could bring in, into play. Uh, the COVID though is um, been around for two years and not going anywhere soon. But one thing that it has actually highlighted, as we all do know, is still the disproportionate health inequality that actually affects our community. And, and so we'll still be going in that direction, but we're tying that with the uh, UN Decade for Healthy Aging 2020 to 2030. Uh, and so healthy aging will be that uh, the concept we're going to bring into play this time around as well. Now, what is healthy aging? It's just the things that you would do to make sure that you live the later part of your life at your own terms and do the things you want to do. Now, somebody might think we're not saying old age, the aging doesn't actually mean it's old age. It doesn't mean that you, all of us are aging and you can see aging in two concepts. One, either as chronological age, which means that we start age from the day we were born, or you can see as biological age, which means that we grow up to about 30 and then we start aging from there. I think the concept of the, of the UN decade for, for healthy aging is to try and optimize the biological age which means that every adult should be involved in that kind of a discussion. And so we've chosen some topics that will fit into these two themes to mitigate the disproportionate health inequality that we're facing, and also to tally with the tenet of the UN Decade of Healthy Aging. And the next webinar will be in that line and will be coming up in April, on April the 30th, and it will be on exercise as a means of optimizing healthy aging. We're going to bring in very fantastic panelists in that field, but we're also inviting our community to also get involved because this time around there'll be very, there were very groups dealing with the teams and the groups don't have to be just CAMDOC members. We're also inviting people from out of CAMDOC to be part of that endeavor. And, and after that, before, we get to that next webinar, we would have published a series of other webinars that we have right up until November of this year. So stay tuned. We're not only going to be doing webinars, we'll also be doing face-to-face -face discussions and stuff. We, uh, as you 
all know or should know, we have our AGM dinner gala coming up on the 20th, 25th of June. And during the morning session, we're going to have a face-to-face -face discussion and demonstration sessions. And it has always been the tradition that we have the Cameroon Day in August. We're also hoping that we're going to be in that on that occasion. But this time around, we're going to do some health screenings and health talks and the one-to-one. And those who want to know things like their blood pressures and their blood sugars will be come dog will be there with all the guardians to talk to you and do all those tests and advice accordingly. So there's going to be a very busy year, very exciting year, very exciting topics. And I'll encourage everybody to be informed and inform your families and friends as well. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ngua. Um, so uh, this brings us uh, nicely to the close of our uh, webinar. I couldn't uh, end the webinar without first and foremost thanking our, our speakers again, you know, uh, Dr. Nafti, one for the brilliant introduction and for also suggesting that we do this talk. Um, Dr. Uh, Serge Ngamba, thank you so much for giving your time today. I know you were doing a few things in between today and you really made sure that you were able to join us. Thank you. Dr. Malik, what can I say? We could feel the menopause knowledge coming out from your pores. <laughs> and I just felt like I wish you could be sat in my surgery with me when I have those difficult cases. You made everything look so simple and straightforward. And uh, really thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts for this. Um, all of this is being recorded, as I said. Please do uh, go to our website, www.camdoc.uk.org. You'll see all the links to our Twitter, Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube page. Speaking of socials and YouTube pages, I cannot end without thanking uh, two special people, well, three. Um, the webinar was being sort of behind the scenes run by uh, Sammy Joe. I don't know if he's going to let us look at his lovely face. He's one of our CAMDOC honorary members. His dad is our vice chairperson, and he helps us with all of the, uh, uh, you know, all the technological stuff. So he's been helping us today. Our communications and social secretary, uh, Anna Bene who again, despite her busy schedule today, she made sure, <laughs> even though she was working, <laughs> to come on and, and, and do that. Uh, Christian, uh, who is all the way from the US, uh, our webmaster, again, I don't know what time it is there, Christian, but thank you for being here. Uh, Judwin, or Lady Jan, as we call her, for all of your um, writing in the chats and, and, and engaging with everyone all of our other CAMDOC members, jo John Ayuk, uh, for answering some of the questions there for us. And um, without further ado, I shall uh, bid you good night and uh, see you again soon, hopefully on the 30th of April and mark the 25th of June in your calendars as the day when you'll see us all in person at our AGMs. And um, we've probably sent you all of the uh, save the dates. So June the 25th, remember that date, 30th of April, remember those two dates. All right then, good night. <laughs>